Thank you very much, Paolo. Thank you, everybody, for being here. We have 20 minutes to go through almost 200 slides, so let's get going. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about two complementary trends uh, that are really taking uh, our planet by storm. The visible impact of exponential technologies and how they are coming together is making possible a new type of socio-economic organization based on distributed networks that are decentralized rather than hierarchical organizations that previously were possible. Uh, I just finished writing a book about these uh, topics uh, that is coming out in a few weeks uh, 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 from the Italian publisher Herpley, and you are very welcome to pre-order the book, and if you send me an email with your pre-order, I will send you the uh, e-book version of it right away, and you can start reading and then give the uh, paper book as a gift to your mother or your uncle that uh, still enjoy the, the feeling. Uh, I also like to make sure that our conversations are not uh, unidirectional, so please tweet me, seek me out on Facebook, or send me an email. Uh, it is very easy to find me online, and I like to engage with my audience regardless. The themes that I want to cover all uh, are centered around the fact that the human species really was born through technology. When 100,000 years ago, or maybe 200,000, we uh, started using fire, and it allowed us to pre-digest food so that we wouldn't need to spend as much time as uh, otherwise our uh, cousins, uh, apes, uh, still do, that was the time that we started on this journey that we are still uh, going through with really amazing and unexpected consequences. We heard a lot about robotic cars today, but do you know why robotic cars are igniting research about 3D printed organs? Well, the first cause of death for people between 25 and 35 years of age is car accidents. And they are very conveniently dying at a young age because their organs can be transplanted into old people. And with uh, robotic cars preventing those deaths, old people still want their replacement organs. And so that is the reason why a lot of people are now dedicating a lot of attention in uh, starting this new industry of 3D printed human organs. Our technological change uh, creates a global civilization that is extremely complex. Uh, DNA sequencing is going to be available very soon uh, to everybody, and the insurance industry will have to cope with it whether I do not get insured because I think that I don't need it uh, based on my uh, genetic uh, um, makeup, or because I do get insurance because I do think that my probability of getting ill is higher than average. Either way, the industry is totally incapable of, of uh, modeling that according to its current uh, makeup. But at the same time, uh, what we have in front of us is creating incredible opportunities. We are already seeing the first trillion dollar companies being created and um, at uh, Singularity University where I'm an advisor and a member of the faculty, one of our co-founders, Peter Diamandis, actually has an evening lecture uh, entitled Who Wants to Be a Quadrillionaire? Uh, very provocatively uh, aiming to open the minds of our students uh, to incredible opportunities that we are seeing uh, in front of us. Google, uh, when um, they helped uh, uh, funding Singularity University initially, and now they are actually giving scholarships to 100% of our students. So getting at Singularity University now is not a question of money anymore. It is a question of being smart. And NASA, uh, who uh, are hosting Singularity University on the uh, Ames Research Center campus, uh, aim to uh, achieve our goals together of analyzing the impact of exponential technologies in uh, AI, biotech, nanotech, networks, and computing systems as they are transforming society, bringing solutions to us that are ever more faster, effective, uh, efficient, and they go through phases where they are almost invisible, but 
at the end, totally transform society by digitizing, dematerializing, demonetizing, and democratizing uh, our uh, ways of living. Exponentials are really hard to uh, grasp uh, when they start. Naturally so, because the normal signals that we are uh, paying attention to um, hide uh, um, what is uh, going on at the beginning. Also, linear uh, growth in those phases actually is more powerful than exponential growth, so we are naturally driven on of latching on those linear uh, phenomena rather than the underlying exponential. But then when these doublings, and it doesn't matter whether it occurs in 18 months like uh, classical Moore's law or more uh, rapidly or more slowly, but when a, a threshold is passed and the doublings keep going, that is when it becomes visible, um, actually allowing everybody to recognize it, jump on the winning horse and say, wow, I, I knew it all along. A, the evolution of computers uh, is what we are most familiar with in this sense, but uh, these um, trends are everywhere. The decoding of the human genome um, took 15 years, ended in 2000, but started in uh, 1985 and cost $3 billion. 15 years later today, you can have your genome sequenced in about a week for less than $2,000. We are closer to $1,000 already. But the change is not slowing down. And it is predicted that by 2020, 2022, uh, full genome sequencing is going to be available in real time for an incremental cost of about two cents for each human genome. So imagine living in a world like that. Imagine the power of transformation that you are going to be living, not in 100 years, not in 50 years, in merely five, seven years from today. And the very frequent objection of actually uh, this being just a logistics curve, an S-curve that is going to be exhausted, uh, is misunderstanding the statement because we are talking about a series of exponential uh, growths that uh, design the curve that we are riding together. This allowed us to create a global civilization that we are using to explore all the varieties that we can structure our uh, ways of living together in order to find what is the best adapted way for every given conditions that we meet. And uh, the interconnected virtuous circle of hardware, software, and design thinking is what drove uh, from uh, uh, the first vacuum tube-based computers to uh, the first uh, integrated circuits and transistors to now at a point where we are starting finally to embrace quantum phenomena to build the next generation computers that are going to be incredibly powerful. At Singularity University, uh, or rather at the NASA campus, uh, ran actually, uh, or in the team of the group that runs it, uh, there is also uh, an Italian um, former student of Singularity uh, University, Davide Venturelli. Uh, there are uh, quantum computers that Google tested and they are better than anything they could throw at uh, in specific applications, for example, in image recognition. But also, the software that is becoming better and better. Uh, the first computers were completely blind, and they l forgot everything uh, when you turned them off uh, in the evening. Then they started to have uh, conversations with us about the world through uh, the typewriter. Today, they recognize touch or our movements they can actually have verbal conversations. And the next generations of operating systems are going to be based on these kinds of dialogues in order to understand what we want and what they can uh, lead us towards. But things are not stopping here, and there are already brain-computer interfaces that allow direct communication just by thinking. This is the kind of intelligence augmentation where people 
working together with computers are much better than not computers alone or people alone. And we are then able, as a team, to attack our global grand challenges. For certain tasks, computers are already superhuman. Whether it is playing a specific set of video games, or whether it is regularly beating at chess, uh, basically anybody except occasionally a, 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 a given group of uh, uh, very talented uh, individuals, AI has arrived. It is around us. We just pretend to move the goalpost at every time that uh, uh, the, the smart people working on these problems achieve something. So when uh, the world champion of chess was beaten uh, by IBM's big blue computer, uh, universally it was basically remarked, oh, that's just chess. Even if a year before, that was the holy grail of, of artificial intelligence. And today we are uh, seeing a, a, a really wonderful new accomplishment being brought to the world by AI, the capability of self-driving cars uh, that uh, are very different from what we are seeing and the way we are seeing. The image you uh, have here on this slide is what the machine sees. This is the way that the machine sees the world in 360 degrees at a resolution that is not limited by human reflexes, but it is a thousand times a second resolution in time. And uh, these cars drove uh, in this augmented reality, as augmented by their senses, almost two million kilometers in California with no accident that can be attributed to the uh, robotic car itself. Uh, about a dozen accidents that were uh, caused by other human drivers um, crashing into, into the, the, the robotic cars. But, and look at this, that's not how it is. They don't wear Oculus goggles. I just put them on. Every day, the robotic cars go to sleep and dream in virtual reality of driving five million kilometers in a simulated reality and then wake up to be better at driving in the physical world the day after. This is what virtual reality and augmented reality are for. In order to change the parameters of what is space and time, as augmented intelligence and artificial intelligence live together to solve our problems. And of course, it is a classic sociological thought experiment. Oh, what do you do with the trolley? Do you throw the fat guy in the tracks to stop the train that otherwise would kill five people? And you can definitely apply this trolley problem to the robotic car too. And the robotic car will think about it and then will say, okay, I pull, push the fat guy to save five people or I don't push the fat guy, but it is bullshit. We are not talking about thought experiments here. We are talking about preventing one million people dying in car accidents per year. That is what we are talking about extremely concretely. And there are every possible signals that uh, at least 90%, and we are not saying 100% because we want to be modest, 90% of these uh, deaths will be um, prevented concretely. And 50 million people don't die, but get injuries that then uh, they bring with them for the rest of their lives. We also have to give machines survival instincts. It must be impossible to tell a plane to crash into the mountain with 200 people on board. There is no reason why that should be a command that machines should obey. Machines must be able to disobey human uh, orders. Now, when I'm talking about machines, I am not talking about only a physical object. I'm also talking about organizations that have a hard time adapting to this new reality too. 
if at the beginning of the century, uh, when you arrived at the peak of your corporate success, you had a probability of staying there for over 60 years, today that level uh, of grandiose accomplishment is reduced to little more than 10 years. And it doesn't matter if you are a 100 years uh, leader of a given industry. If your thinking is linear, there will be 10 people who beat you at the game, and when you lay off the last 10,000 people before going bankrupt, they will be acquired for a billion dollars by Facebook. And the way that our society is structured is really uh, strange. 1% feeds everybody. Another 1% extracts all the raw materials. 6% houses everybody else. 10% builds all the useful and not useful gadgets and objects that are around us. In the first slice of the service sector, as we call this, concentrates on human-to-human -human value, or of what are the relationships of how we care for each other. But that chart actually only refers to what is called the workforce. And workforce participation is declining very rapidly in the industrialized countries. The number of hours that those who are in the workforce diminish also. What is very important is that we understand that the derogatory uh, label that we attach to people must be as banned and as shameful as other labels that we abandoned because we would not want to discriminate against those people. We cannot keep calling people who don't work unemployed. Because human talent is not an externality. We have to be able to understand how we shape a society where the opportunity to work is, is not a right it is actually a privilege linked to your creativity, linked to your um, various uh, aspirations, but that doesn't mean that society can afford to expel everybody else. And even as corporations find out that the variations of the different solutions uh, for our problems uh, change from place to place, what we understand is that it's not possible to live in a global dictatorship. We have to develop and maintain and nurture empathy and tolerance towards what are different ways of living, except that we cannot tolerate intolerance. We have to better understand how to make smart choices about our ethical intuitions, our moral common sense. We cannot rely on Bronze Age clay tables that received our relegated wisdom and we were content on closing our eyes what is the scientific method. We have to take on the challenge of developing a science and an engineering of morality. Only then we will be able to face the machines and to realize that they are there to help us to together face common challenges and common problems and the favorite nightmare of Hollywood movies is going to be as laughable as it should be. This phase transition of autonomous machines is what is going to empower us to survive the Anthropocene that today is clearly unsustainable. But as we finished continents that we can pillage and uh, uh, despoil, we also realized that unsustainability itself has become unsustainable we didn't become uh, zealous supporters of sustainability because we are better people. We just don't have a new Australia or a new America where we can kill everybody. As we try to decode this uncertainty about the future, it doesn't matter where we are in New York or in Hong Kong. What we dream about, and our dreams can be exciting but Leonardo dreamed about helicopters 500 years before it was their time. We have to work on with passion. And as we develop solutions like human-powered spaceflight, we have to be very careful not to listen 
to the naysayers who want us to fail, even if there is no guarantee that we will be able to solve those challenges. There are only 7 billion people on the planet, and we don't know where uh, the solutions are going to come from. So we need everybody, and that is what I want to end my talk with. Thank you.